point, uh, we'll move to debate of the issue, and um, I'm going to ask Jeff to speak first, um, and then the uh, the mover of the amendment. We don't. It's not as far as my understanding of standing orders go. We don't go mover, seconder of the motion. We go mover, and then mover of the amendment, and then it's open to the floor. So that's the order. I'll do it, Jeff. Thank you, Dave. Can I just check the speaking time? Is it three minutes for everything on this uh, meeting? No, or? no, that was just for public forum. It okay, is I'm just five. looking at the clock because it says um, three at the moment. Oh. It, it, so it's it, five? It, it, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We'll correct that. Thank you. But it's rigid five, no, not extra extensions or anything. Never go over it. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to move the staff recommendation today uh, to extend the two hours free uh, parking trial to June 2020. Uh, at which point this council will have worked through a detailed parking management plan for the entire city and be in a position to continue the progress of this trial and implement a cohesive city-wide strategy. Uh, in the meantime, continuing with the trial as is, has, which has been extremely successful, is the only responsible logical action to take today in my view. Let me paint a quick picture for you. Uh, when the trial was introduced in October 7, 2017, average parking occupancy, uh, the percentage of cars parked in the CBD during the workday was sitting at around 69%, and it showed. We were beset with negative perceptions about parking in the CBD compared to other shopping areas like the base and Chartwell. Since that time, under two hours free, average parking occupancy has increased on average from 69% to 84% across the CBD, 84%. That's 15% increase and a dramatic improvement. And it shows. What you see now is active activity and optimism. What you see now is a series of upbeat, buzzing media releases from the CBD Association and others as they enjoy a CBD that is once again thriving. What else have we seen? Since the introduction of two hours free, spending in the CBD has risen significantly. More people are working in town, more people are choosing to live in town. GDP from the CBD is increasing. I'm not saying two hours free is solely responsible for all of this, it isn't. But it, is certainly, it has certainly played a part. You've heard this morning Vanessa from the association say it is a key part of revitalising the city. Those are her words, not mine. But wait, there's more. The retailers who are helping to pay for two hours free love it. 93% of 134 respondents thought it was a good idea in the survey. 91% want it to continue. Shoppers love it. 96% of shoppers out of 479 thought it was a good idea. 34% said they came into the CD, CBD more often as a result. Now, I don't think anybody even me expected the degree of success with the result of this, well, sorry, the degree of success that we've got from this. It was a risk, it was scary, and there were plenty of naysayers. But the key, as I, as I have always said, was to change perceptions. When two hours free came in, we struggled to build a positive perception for the CBD. We have changed the perception in a very short time. Now people are saying the CBD is a good place to come, a good place to invest, a good place to work, and a good place to live. If we don't go with this today and we go back to our previous system, <coughs> remember what that was. Before nine and after three, uh, a somewhat arbitrary uh, uh, system where uh, after those times it was free, but the rest of the time you still had to fish in your pocket for a $2 coin. Do you really want to go back to that? You'll be fully aware of how long it takes to educate the community about a new system. We still have people putting money in parking meters now. How confused do you think you're going to make people if we go back to that archaic system? It's madness. The ludicrous thing is if we did go back to that system, you'd save bugger all money. To institute it, you need to spend 600k unbudgeted for, on parking kiosks to replace our parking meters, which are about to die. It's right there on page 132. 600k unbudgeted. And what's more, you'll save only 300k of operating expenditure. Not these millions I keep hearing about. 
So instead, what staff are proposing is that we do more research, that we complete a comprehensive study, which we probably should have done years ago, on how the city's parking strategy should work as a whole. Uh, how we cater for commuter parking, uh, the CBD, the fringe of the CBD, Frankton, Hospital, University, Hamilton East, Chartwell, Tarapa, the lot. How we deal with schools and pick up, drop off. Uh, how we cater better for busy sports fields. So um, I won't go on too much longer, but I'll just say um, these are exciting times and I'm proud uh, of what this trial has produced. At times it's been challenging and I thank staff for their fantastic efforts, but we have made a real difference in the CBD and it gives us a great starting point to continue. So I proudly move the staff recommendation. Let's allow two hours free to finish the great job it Thanks. started. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Uh, Councillor Robb. I came to this meeting with a bit of a fear that if um, we didn't have a change to the staff recommendation, the staff recommendation motion would be lost. So my attempt uh, with the amendment is to try and find a, a pathway to a more acceptable uh, reason to extend the, uh, the trial. I don't think on its own um, the need for a parking plan is a good enough reason to extend the present uh, to our free parking for yet another year. I think there was a good reason last year because we were collecting in a lot of information about whether or not the trial that we had after one year or after nine months was in fact successful. And uh, I think that was, there was a valid reason to extend it for another year um, because in other areas where it had been stopped too quickly, um, it had, it had, where, where they thought in the short term it had failed, in fact, um, uh, this was an opportunity to see whether or not there was likely to be success in it. The fact, uh, when I look at uh, the table, table seven, on page 130, <clears throat> it suggests to me that uh, from the time we had the uh, free before nine and after three, there was an operating surplus of 1.5 million. We are now budgeting for a loss of 590,000 uh, for the 1819 year. And I understand w we will come in at less than that, but somehow the, the difference between before the trial and now is around about $2 million. I accept that not all of that relates to um, the free parking because there's been um, si significant investment in, um, in parking technology, um, some of which will be reflected in the depreciation. But the $1 million that we expected it to cost, in my view, has ballooned, and I suspect that it's probably closer to $1.5 million than the one million that we originally budgeted back in 17, for 1718. So I think my amendment is perhaps a pathway to achieving um, one um, recognition that, that, that retailers in the city are finding it successful. We're asking them to pay a little more, but not the total cost. And we're taking some of the pressure or the high cost off our ratepayer who has got choice, who, who have got choices as to whether they go somewhere where it's free or whether they come into the city. And I don't think on its own it's fair that the significant portion of the cost should be borne by the ratepayer um, citywide. That makes uh, the um, amendment perhaps on the way to being a little more consistent with other shopping and retail precincts. And, um, and on this basis, I believe that it is a much fair and equitable way that we're asking business not to pay the full cost, which is what they do at the base and, and, uh, and Chartwell Square, but to at least pay um, a proportion uh, which is a little, more, um, a, a little more significant than the meagre 140,000 that we are currently collecting from them. So I ask you on that basis, if you're thinking of not supporting uh, the, the um, continuation of the trial, that, that you consider supporting my amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Just um, before we go on, Angela's question before, we've done the maths over here, and it works out if there are the same number of units, and there's probably going to be a small increase, I'd imagine, but if they were the same, it would be $378 annual fee as opposed to the current figure of 110. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. But 
if there are the same number of units. So, Angela, you're next. Thanks. Um, look, I've um, often said on issues that we talk about the CBD that perception is the key here and we are fighting against perception. Certainly public safety in the CBD over the years that I've seen and I've sat in this chamber, chamber and fought against public perception. Um, so I think uh, while I was a strong opposer to this proposal, we cannot... We cannot ignore the public's perception and that that has changed and I congratulate Councillor Taylor for his push on that. I did a post on social media and I alerted Councillor Bunting and Taylor to it. There was over 130 comments and they were very insightful comments, not the usual hugely passionate, oh it's rubbish and but all, oh I hate it. They were people that said they now come to the CBD because of free parking, but they went further than that. So I think I still don't believe that price matters. I don't believe that most people are not willing to pay $2 for premium central city parking. And let's be real here, we are going to have to, at some point in the future, remove free parking. But this trial, I don't think it's a great success, but it is a tool in the toolbox. And we did hear from the Central Business Association today. So I think it's important that the trial continue. The future, uh, we need to continue the trial as well so we carry on getting data because we still don't have trend data. It hasn't been in place long enough. But what is really important and what I have always been on board with is technology. And that, I believe, is the real kicker for if we just look at the base and we look at Tiawa Underground. You drive in there, and people have told me time and time again, you don't even have to think, where am I going to park? And I've got the kids screaming at me in the back of the car because of their technology. You just don't have to think. And if we could be a city in New Zealand that could put that type of technology into our CBD making it so easy that people do not even have to think where they're going to park, we will be on to a winner. So because this trial is a tool in the toolbox to get us to that point, I'm going to support it. I'm not um, comfortable with the amendment because we did hear from the Business Association. Now, of course, they're going to say, well, I don't want my fees to increase. Um, but we went out with a commitment that this trial would be funded a particular way, and for another 12 months I'm going to support that. I don't like the idea of loading an extra cost onto, and let's face it, the majority of businesses in town that the association represents are small to medium-sized businesses. They're family-owned, that's what we saw today. So I'm uncomfortable with pushing a cost onto those businesses right now, so that's why I support the motion. Thank you. Uh, Mark, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Angela, and, uh, and Rob and Jeff for your um, contributions there. Um, I took a lot from them, actually. <clears throat> I just want to reframe um, this just a tiny bit. We're assuming that this is a great cost to the ratepayer. Now, we've got to remember what the source of that money was in the first place. When we walked into our very first uh, parking task force meeting, I was appalled to find out that two-thirds of our income came from penalties, from tickets from people getting the system wrong. Um, and only about one million of it came from parking metres and metres charges on dated equipment. And I thought, that, gee, I can't, I just, gee, I really wonder why people hate our guts. Because we'll only survive if people get it wrong and we're penalising them. That money, okay, while we see it as a cost, is not actually ours in the first place. When we talk about revitalising the CBD, isn't it ironic that the only place we would charge for parking in our entire city was the CBD. We have been penalising the CBD for years and years and years. And people were taking the mickey. I was one of them. We had a, a, a paltry little ageing $2 um, parking metre uh, system, and we've all played parking roulette. We've all gone down there and thought, we won't put anything in the, in the metres, hope we won't get caught, and if we get a $12 fine, well, hang on a minute, I think I've parked enough time that I've got my money's worth. It wasn't working. It simply wasn't working. The CBD trial came in, or the uh, Two Hours Free and the CBD trial came in as a part of the very good work that has been done already, um, and uh, it was firmly to revitalise the CBD, and evidence is showing quite clearly that it is. 
Um, <clears throat> as you heard from the, the joyous cries from the, uh, the CBD Business Association, people are happy. Shoppers are happy. Shoppers are enjoying themselves. People are spending more. People are spending more time. People are spending more money. It's not a perfect system by any means. Uh, we've found with the trial that uh, there have been various uh, issues that we can fix. And uh, that's another reason I'd like to extend this trial, so we get a chance to fix these. Uh, it has brought people in. There are parts of, um, parts of the city now that are actually too busy, so we're going to have to start managing that. Uh, demand responsive parking uh, charges may be, the, um, may be the answer. Validation has proven to be quite the issue with our new system, and uh, our parking people are working very hard, and there's a potential to improve it and, again, to, uh, to bring in some more money. So while I appreciate Councillor Pascoe's um, endeavours to bring in some more money for this, I think, uh, to use his words, it's the wrong pathway to take. Uh, there are other levers we can pull, but we can only pull them now that we've got the system in place. Uh, things like demand responsive parking. It may be one hour's free option in the centre of town where it's busy and two hours out on Harwood Street, perhaps. There's all this sort of stuff we're still talking over. But if we biff this trial, we can't do that. Um, there are other ways of, of, um, uh, of or other people to charge. This is just the first step. So um, uh, while I appreciate the amendment, I won't be supporting it. I'll be supporting the motion uh, to carry this along. And believe me, those discussions are robust uh, in Access Hamilton and in, the, and in the parking task forces. So, um, so come along and, and have your say. We're open to all ideas. But let's keep it going that, as it's going at the moment. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Ryan, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think it's, it's clearly obvious that the free parking metre is about to run out. Uh, we need to put a little bit more time in the metre for now. I think Councillor Rob makes quite a valid point, and whilst I would like to have a little bit more time to have fleshed out and tested it with the market, I would be supportive of that because as much as I want to revitalise the CBD, and our retailers have been partnering with us, they um, can continue to partner it. And I, I don't think an additional... Uh, $268 per unit or per shop is ex ex exorbitant. I think that's a reasonable request to make of them as they partner with um, supporting increased retail in the CBD. So I'd be supporting that amendment. Uh, retailers definitely need to work with us in the process. I also agree with Councillor um, O'Leary. I think that it's not just about price. I don't think price is a real deterrent for people to park in the CBD, but rather one of convenience. And I would really encourage staff to continue fleshing out, and I'm sure you are already, the technology that would support um, streamlined parking. I, I believe there's technology that can scan credit cards or scan your rego and charge your credit card. Uh, that sort of stuff, um, it just makes it non-clunky. I don't know if there's still the technology in there. I remember a few years ago you had to get a ticket from one machine, remember what code you'd parked on, put that into the machine, go back, put that in the dashboard, and it was, it was and then it was just terrible. So, um, yeah, we need to move forward in a streamlined way. Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Paula, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to repeat a lot of that because um, Councillor Hamilton has articulated so well many of the points I wanted to make. I'm going to support the motion today. Um, I was uh, one of those who was sitting on the fence about whether to go into this trial in the first place, uh, and um, I was persuaded of the merits of uh, the trial from a point of view of gathering data, useful data and trend analysis of what's actually happening in the parking area of town. We didn't really know, but now we know so much more because of the trial, which I think is one of the success points of the trial. Uh, we've got real, genuine data to go off, and I think that's good, and that's why I support it going forward. I think I support Councillor Hamilton's points and others have made. It's about easy access. It's not just about how much you pay. It's about knowing where that vacant space is when you need one and having easy access to it. Um, and the technology will advance. We've got very old technology in place. We've got a sort of a hodgepodge of te technology, but we know what IT's like in... Um, a very short time there's going to be app-based technology that will deal with this quite seamlessly. Um, one thing I do want to raise a flag about, though, is that, uh, and I've discussed this with Councillor Taylor a number of times, I want to see a focus on how we solve and sort commuter parking. Um, I believe there <coughs> are still people um, scrabbling around to move their car from here to there and there to here and trying to work out where they can park. So we've got some work to do that 
there because we do need to enable people who run and operate businesses in the CBD to get to their businesses and to, you know, park in a reasonable distance from the CBD um, quite easily. So I'm interested in um, commuter, commuter technology, how we get commuters to uh, work the parking and how we get park and ride going. We've got the central city free CBD shuttle still going. Is that working optimally now that things are changing with where apartments are going and businesses are going and cars want to go? Or do we need to review that and see if we can hook it into a park and ride situation for commuters and get best use out of that, that bus service? Uh, that also was a service that had a very good role in the beginning to move people around town, but things have changed. I personally believe that um, having heard a um, presentation on some of the inner city um, residential development, we're going to find things change over the next few years. We're going to find that people living in the city mean that there's going to be more foot traffic in the city, and those people are going to use the CBD services, not go anywhere else, and they're <coughs> going to walk there. And so, you know, all things need to be seen as a, a, as a package together. Uh, we've got some other conversations coming up around supporting the CBD too, development. So these things, I think, we've got to keep that broad um, look at it and make sure that things are working consistently together for the right outcome in the CBD. But I will support it. Thanks. Uh, Martin, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to um, congratulate one of my colleagues, Councillor Jeff Taylor, for his passion and leadership on this particular proposal. I also think from a governance point of view, it's a very good uh, example of how a, a, a specified task force subcommittee, whatever we call it, of elected members working with staff in a collegial way uh, can sort out the nuts and the bolts and the detail. Then, of course, it comes to the uh, relevant standing committee. I also think um, the this particular proposal does reflect a genuine partnership uh, with the Central uh, Hamilton Central City uh, Business Group, and of whom have made submissions this morning. We have had very clear feedback from retailers uh, that this has helped their business. This has made a contribution to the CBD's vitality. From my point of view, as an ordinary uh, consumer motorist. Um, it means that if I go to chart or the base or the CBD, they're on equal footing, fundamentally. They're on equal footing. And uh, I love the system in the sense that, and I recognise my rate bill subsidises it to a degree, as does the rate bill of the CBD business community big time. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not sort of searching for credit cards, coins and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so I think uh, I'll be strongly supporting that this trial continues. And obviously we are looking at this with other levers of how we revitalise the CBD. I think the CBD is making some really good progress for a range of reasons. And anecdotally, I am noticing the increase of foot traffic in the CBD area, and that's fantastic. Please. Uh, look, I commend um, Councillor Jeff. This has been, well, was his election mandate. I understand before Jeff, um, while Jeff was running for council, to bring free parking into the CBD, as was mine. Um, I, I, and mine is still up on my website from the last election. It was for one hour, but when the surveys came through and we realised that people were parking for one hour and nine minutes on average one hour would have still caused a lot of trouble and a lot of people would have been caught out. And um, so I was totally supported right from the start, as Jeff did, all the way through um, the two-hour free parking and have never wavered from it. Um, so I, I just um, congratulate you for not being somebody who's um, pushed around for public opinion um, because the public opinion, and certainly the council's opinion, wasn't with you, Jeff, to start with. Um, but you've held fast, you've stood firm, and, you've, and it appears you're going to get here. And I just cannot wait for the day to come that this isn't, we're not playing around with the trial anymore, and we can get the gas acts out and cut out those parking metres, sell them as antiques, and stop people who don't know the system in our city coming in, standing in front of their metres, which we all see, while they're feeding in $2 coins, 
and stomping their feet in dismay because each time they put in $2, they get about 15 minutes of parking because it's all set up for $6 an hour after you've been there for two hours. So um, this isn't helping, and the sooner we can remove those metres, the happier I'll be. Yes, technology will follow, but the technology isn't here yet to do it to the best way that we would like it to be. But meanwhile, the people of this city come first. Meanwhile, the people in our city who are running shops, who are struggling to make it work, and under this regime, and I do believe it is because of this regime, and I do believe you do need to take the credit, Jeff, that the shops are picking up and there is more money being spent. And it's absolutely fantastic to see that the simple thing like street, streetscape and parking can turn the CBD around, and it has, in a short time, in around about 18 months. And I believe that will continue, especially once those, gas meet, meet, uh, those metres have been gas axed out. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, last one on the list is Councillor Siggy. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I, I wasn't actually even sitting on the fence. I was actually totally against it, but um, somehow one of the councillors twisted my arm and I did support the trial. And I do want to uh, congratulate um, Councillor Taylor for his passion and persistence and on this issue because this is what is needed in the city when we want to change something we need passion we need persistence to keep it going just like he said there are there are some naysayers and i wasn't always excited about this but you know along the way um i think that just like uh, Councillor O'Leary said, perception is everything. People will come into the city if they believe it's vibrant, it's exciting, there's something new happening. They will come here, they will spend their money here. And um, hearing this morning, or just earlier on, um, the business owners, and I, I, it just reminded me of, um, you know, struggling business, Small business, boutique businesses will, are struggling at the start and we want to support them as much as we can. And maybe asking them for some more money might not be the right time at the moment because they've ju they're just new in the business. And don't we want to attract more boutique businesses into the city? Something different, not the chain stores that we've got at the base or in Chartwell. So having something that's, that's um, more brings a different vitality into the city I'm really excited about. And I think the perception of having an exciting city will bring these boutique businesses into the city. And so we, we, it all will build on, on top of each other. And just like Councillor um, uh, Southgate Paula said, uh, we were last night listening to what's going to happen in the inner city with, with um, with um, all the new developments and um, the apartments and everything, I, I believe Hamilton will become the Hamilton that I remember 30 years ago when Garden Place was really busy and, and, um, and vibrant. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future, the continuing trial and getting uh, more data from that. But um, yeah, I'm excited for, for, for the future of our city. Thank you. Thanks, councillors. We're going to move to the vote, except there's one correction to make in E. None of our train spotters have spotted this one, except for the staff. It should read 7th of May 2019, not 18. <laughs> no. Oh, sorry. Do you want to write? Yeah. All right. Oh, my apologies. I was trying to twist Jeff's arm not to have him write a private. He's got three minutes. Three minutes? Easy. Uh, councillors, thank you very much for your, your thoughtful uh, comments and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, um, Councillor O'Leary uh, and Siggy for, for changing your positions there, but also on, on, on your thoughtful comments. Um, and I agree, uh, um, Angela, that uh, I don't think price itself was a lever, but I do think convenience was an issue in terms of feeding metres. I never did it. I know that. I, I never could. Um, I just never had any money, to, any coins to do it. So, and I do think um, um, that June 2020, with a decent study and some of the technology that may well be at our disposal then, that we've got exciting times ahead. And I think some element of demand pricing is, is, is probably going to be the way to go. Um, Eva Lisa has shown me uh, pictures of kiosks that you can put in that can do dozens of things except tie your tie. They can do just about everything else for you, you know, and... and uh, you know, maybe there's a pathway forward there, but that's just one of the things we can look at. Thank, thanks, um, uh, Mayor Andrew, for your support there. Um, much appreciated. 
Um, I haven't talked about the money much in response to, to Councillor Pascoe's comments. I suppose my understanding is still pretty much that, that lost revenue is sitting at about $1 to $1.3 million. And, and I'm a little bit um, irked that somehow um, <laughs> internal charges, council overhead seem to have ballooned it up to about $2 million. And I do struggle with that aspect of it because um, that just seems to have come from nowhere as far as I can say. I don't believe that the true, the true deficit is around about one to $1.3 million on an annual basis. We're, so, no, no, we're not going to get into a debate on that because you expressed your opinion and he's expressing his. Yeah, no, and there's no yeah, overhead. Yeah, no, we understand well, there that. Is. Yeah, yeah. That's not true. Um, I disagree. So, so uh, I think there is one point that's correct there. You should be addressing your comments to what's in the report in yep. respect of the figures, not to what Rob said. Yep. OK. Um, in terms of the, the uh, possibility of ramping up the CBD, um, what the, re the retailers pay by between three and four times, um, I think it's a little late in the piece to be doing that respectfully. I think... Um, uh, you know, there have been many Access Hamilton meetings where we've discussed uh, parking and where CBD uh, people have been present. We're perhaps, you know, if it could have been brought up a bit earlier, we could have socialised it and discussed it. I just feel it's a little, at this late stage, it's pretty hard to hit them with that. Um, my feeling is that uh, we're working really hard to try and revitalise the central city. We've been agonising about the CBD remission. Uh, we're celebrating how well they're going, and I hate to kick them in the guts now. So I would urge councillors not to support the amendment um, at this stage and stick with it. And then June 2020, we've got a very exciting uh, time ahead. Thank you. Thanks. No, you don't. Sorry. But um, I will point out that this is a recommendation to council. So there is the opportunity there, Rob, and anyone else to uh, renew issues in that or refine them. So councillors, we're going straight to the voting on the amendment. It's, in front, it's up there um, with the corrected date in E. Um, C is the change that Rob's proposing. Um, those in favour and against, please use the voting board. Yep. Remember, it, the whole thing goes grey as soon as your finger gets anywhere near it. <laughs> the amendment is lost. Three, four, nine against. Thank you. Um, so we move to vote on the uh, motion, which is a staff recommendation to us with the correction, corrected date. Those in favour and against, please vote on the board. The motion is declared carried. 11 4, 1 against. Thanks very much. We move on to the next item now, but just before I do, um, staff have told me off and, and uh, one particular train spotting councillor has pointed out to me that I got the speaking time wrong. Uh, the new standing order says only three minutes, um, so you yeah, got a bit of a bonus there, Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's three minutes from now on, and I, I I found out halfway through, and I wasn't going to change it halfway. Through. <laughs> yeah. Um. Bit of Toastmasters, because he took yeah. five minutes. So. Maybe we'll take the two minutes off him in his next speech and down to one. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're got moving to item seven, which is page 18, and councillors, we were going to have a presentation from the, um, uh, the CEO of Tawaka, but we suggest, or we asked for that not to happen for time reasons, because it's only the six monthly report. Blair's not going to give a presentation, but you're free to ask him questions, and um, so just uh, give you a second to get to page 18, and then... Um, I'm sure that anyone with questions has already got them ready. And it's not going to be just looking them up on the fly. So, do we have any questions on the Tawaka report? Mark, thanks. Just one very quick one, Blair. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, page 6 of your report, page 24 of ours, uh, I noticed the successful progress, um, growth fund applications, uh, but apart from the program manager for Waikato Means Business, who may be domiciled in Hamilton, uh, were there any other Hamilton... Um, applications in there that got uh, to Nano, or are they all just out of Hamilton? Uh, I don't have all the details on those, Councillor Bunting, but there is a substantial uh, application currently being considered 
uh, that Momentum has put in on behalf of projects in the Hamilton area, so that one is still being worked through the process. So, so that's the biggest one of Hamilton interest. Of course, some projects are submitted by uh, companies and individual entities that don't go through Te Waka. So yep. um, certainly going forward, the strong advocacy that Te Waka, uh, would give to anyone applying to PGF is work through Te Waka. Make sure you engage with Te Waka. Michelle Parkey from the um, Ministry, the Government Agency, is based at Tawaka. So applications that work through the Tawaka process uh, are certainly have a better chance of being considered than those that don't. Right. So um, there's no strict process that. No, 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 no one is mandated to work through the Economic Development Agency of Tawaka, but right. certainly those that do are having a better chance of, of the, the application being considered. Right. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Angela, please. Yeah. Um, I forget that we're down that end. <laughs> hey, Blair, um, the five members that are appointed to the board and yourself and Rob um, Williams, so you're on top of that, you're in addition to the five members. So w what's happening with the mayoral, because the mayoral forum can appoint two members, have they chosen not to do that at this point? Yes, so, so Rob Williams and myself are there in an establishment board capacity, so yeah. we are not officially directors of the, the, the company. So the company has five directors, as, as in yeah. the report. Uh, the Merrill Forum recently received a request from um, uh, IWI for the Merrill Forum to exercise its, its ability to nominate members uh, for that to be um, used to support a, an IWI representative on the Twaka board. Uh, so that process has been worked through at the present time, Councillor Leary, uh, and I can say that the conversation between Te Waka, the Chair of the Mural Forum, and the Iwi representatives led by Ruka Moana Shafason have been very positive. So I expect that that process uh, will result in the Mural Forum making a recommendation in, 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 in line with their ability to do so. Okay. And there are, in the Constitution, there are uh, some very different and it was quite confusing when we accepted the constitu Constitution to figure out who drops off when because each director, uh, each number of directors has a different drop-off point. So who's who's getting kicked out first? It's yeah. a, well, the first one was in 12 months, wasn't Correct. it? That a minimum, was it a minimum of two? Correct. Or? Yeah, yeah. So, so look, I, I have to give that to you offline. I'm sorry I don't have that. But certainly the chair um, is the last of the, that three-year yeah. cycle. Uh, so the other directors, and, I, and there is a there is a prescribed mechanism. I'm sorry, I just can't recall that. At the yeah, moment. there's there's two or three different mechanisms yeah. for for um, you know I guess to bring fresh fresh That's fresh correct. eyes into the board. That's correct. Um, and of course, the board also can be anywhere between five and nine members, and currently we're yes, at five. Yeah. Okay. So when when those first it is two, I think, drop yes. off within two. So that's going to be within six months because it's been going for six months, right? Yes. So that those, what's the process again? Can you remind me? Will that come to this council or do the board, can the board fill the vacancies? The, the board fills the vacancies, okay. but it follows a, 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 it follows a robust a process. Uh, and I'd also note that the Merrill Forum um, process is to recommend up to two members to the board. Ultimately, does the board, the constitution records that it is the board's um, final decision as to whether they accept or otherwise those recommendations. Uh, but the process does very much uh, revolve around following a very robust sort of institute of directors type process to select and, and um, uh, gain new candidates. Yeah. There is also the ability for existing incumbents to stand aside but also be available for reselection through that process. Okay. But I'm happy to um, offline Councillor Leary circulate um, yeah. um, more detail on that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, councillors. There being no more questions, I'll move that the report be received, seconded by Jeff the first. Um, any speakers? No. Okay, those in favour, raise their hands. Against, that's carried unanimously. Thanks. Blair, if you stay there, we'll go to item 10 with your everyone's permission, which is the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor Plan Update. Also, Blair being responsible for that. Page 68 on the papers. So we'll just get the page and then I'll take... Um, this is the growth cor the corridor plan update, I should say. So uh, I'll... Once you're ready, I'll take questions on that from councillors. This is only an update. Um, it's a, and it's also endorsing a couple of things that we've already discussed. 
So there's nothing new there, but there's the formal endorsement is attached to the reception of the report. Okay, Rob, thanks. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I couldn't... Uh, paragraph 43, where you refer to the 20 key initiatives, I couldn't find those 20 key initiatives listed anywhere. Are they, are they, are they, have I missed it in terms of the reading? Um, or, or, or are they sort of just dispersed amongst the report and they, there isn't? They are, dispu they are dispersed, Councillor uh, Pasco, uh, through the actual um, corridor plan summary document. So uh, I'm happy to show do you, you where Do you they think are. at some stage you could just produce those 20 initiatives? Because I guess they become potential KPIs for future measurement, don't they? Yes, they do. As and to how well it's progressing, at what speed it's progressing and... Um, Yes, we do. We do have a, a list of those um, in a different different form. So yeah, okay, absolutely. okay. I, I don't know how others feel, but that would be quite useful to have that. And um, and the other question is around fifty six, um, where it says um, with HCC contributing significant resourcing and thought leadership. Um, does that kind of suggest signal um, that we? that Hamilton City Council will need to resource for this separately from existing staff? Or if it doesn't, you know, is there a, is there a potential? And I, and I hear Richard from time to time saying that we're running a pretty lean, mean machine here in terms of, in terms of uh, staff resourcing. Are we likely to uh, need um, some sort of budget here? Are we likely to need additional staff in order to... Um, to lead this process or provide no. the resourcing for this process? No, it's core business for Hamilton City Council. So uh, it is part of our work program. We were, we were working in this area anyway. The, the, the positive aspect of this Council Pasco is that we're able to now work in a lead capacity with the other councils as part of development of the, yep. the Metro Spatial Plan. I underst understand all of that, but you're confident that there's going to be no additional costs required? We're not coming back to Council for any requests, no. OK, OK. And then just a final question, um, which I hope, I hope it's taken as a question, um, but it talks about... Um, which numbers there, uh, six, Sorry, paragraph 69. And it talks about, you know, um, I guess the, the, the question I've got, I, I guess this whole thing is reliant on central government support. Um, look, I think the, the, the central government support is certainly a, a very significant new element to the work that we're doing in the corridor, the work we're doing in the Metro Spatial Plan. So absolutely, it's a huge positive. Uh, the challenge that, and I guess this paragraph refers to, is that we need to make sure that the work we're doing here is enduring irrespective of, of which political party or preferences oh, yeah. are in, in power. We're very confident, councillors, that the work we're doing is necessary, it's important, it takes us to the next level of long-term growth planning. Uh, and we feel as though that um, uh, there, may be, there may be preferences of different political parties in terms of certain aspects of the programme, but the main theme should endure irrespective of who is in government. Okay. And we, we certainly are working towards that basis. Yep. And, and in terms of, and, and maybe in these 20 initiatives, but are there, are there sort of uh, push points that where we're going to need the government to make some decisions? that might be decisions that we might not like or perhaps our, our um, neighbouring councils might not like, but they are necessary uh, in order to, um, to uh, advance the corridor programme? I think that's inevitable, um, but I think it would be a case of potentially using the weight of the government's view to support and, and help us align around some of those matters. But I think an example could be where an urban development authority may be utilised to help um, advance or move growth planning in a certain area more quickly than otherwise may have occurred. Now, that, that is reliant on, for example, the government working with us in partnership to bring that tool to the table. Yeah. So you, you, you're happy that... Uh, you're, you, you think that... Uh, staff and those uh, from the political wing who are involved on this can report back in terms of making sure that um, you know when it when it does come to a particular point where decisions need to be made that they are being made and not being delayed or deferred or yes. or um, procrastinated over, which seems to have been, from my observation, the history around you know future planning, future plan, and so forth. I think if I if I take the advocacy of the mayor and councillor Dave, uh, and 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 I guess the the 
the opportunity we now have in terms of the new partners around the table, that has very much been the Hamilton position and, and what Hamilton seeks from this going forward. This is, a, this is a watershed moment for us in terms of the area to, to really lay a, a long-term platform for, for how the, 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 this growth in this area is shaped. Um, to, to not tackle some of those really macro issues would be a huge failure of the process. So this is, this is what we need to do. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Andrew, please. I will happily move. Uh, did, not, did I? No, I haven't moved it yet. Yeah, okay. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll I'm second. happy to second it if you... No, you move it. Second. Um, and I'll second. Thanks. So we've got that on the table. If there are any, no other questions, I'll put the resolution, which is the staff recommendation on page 68, moved by the Mayor, seconded by myself. Uh, those show of hands, those in favour, against, thanks, that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks very much, Blair. Um, OK, we're on to the Hamilton to Auckland start-up passenger rail service, noting that yesterday Chris managed to slip in an extra um, bit of uh, uh, briefing at the briefing session just to get our um, maps lined up um, so that people knew which areas we were talking about because the maps on page 66 and 67 and the two pages before that are all quite small scale. So hopefully that was helpful to people. Um, thanks for asking for that, Angela. That was a uh, useful exercise and we... Are we going to have them again available today, Chris? I think they they should be here if required. So uh, don't, we don't need that for the start, but um, we will, it might as well as soon as you're able to. Okay, so firstly, we're going to go to questions. Um, I'm just getting the resolution, sorry, which I'll move. Um, the staff recommendation on page 47. Uh, have I got a second for that to get on the table? Yeah, I've got Deputy Mayor there. Thanks. OK, um, so who's first with their questions? If there are no questions, that makes it really quick. Um, Mangai Norm, thank you. Uh, kia ora. Um, Chris, just in regards to uh, a number of uh, development, developmental strategies, they're starting to bilingualise their, their titles and, and I think um, we recognise the corridor and what's it called? He Aorua Kiti Oranga. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to provide a cultural link to this particular development and um, give it that indigeneity in terms of the uh, ingoa Māori or kupu Māori that uh, provides for uh, as an opportunity. So I just want to uh, yeah, table that um, at this time. Your thoughts on that? Uh, y yes. Um, uh, look, I, I had a chat to Mangai Norm just before the meeting on this. I think um, there are opportunities. Uh, we've got a governance group coming up next week, I think, and uh, we can uh, have that conversation around the governance group. So that's something that I attend as well. So. I'll make sure to remind Chris if he doesn't remind me. Yep, yep, no, I've got it well locked in. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Rob, thank you. Thanks, dear. I noticed in the uh, budgets around the Rotakari station. So just say uh, you're referring to a particular page. Just, oh, it would yeah, be I'll helpful if Council did. Yeah, yeah, council no, I appreciate didn't. that. Um, let me just find it now. 53 or? Uh, 50. Uh, page 50. 50, 50 uh, paragraph 51, I think, is the. Um, All right. Uh, the project. It's yeah. Page. So you've got uh, yeah. So yeah. There's it's the bottom there where you've got total opex. You've got no opex in there for the Rotokari station. Um, I mean, is it, is it is it too much guesswork at the moment, or should yep. that be in there given yep. that there will be an ongoing opex cost yep. once it's up and running, whether it's yep. used yep. for a train station and or a, a, a bus or, or just for the bus station. Yep. Um, just to be clear, there, there is OPEX. I think if you read the table, okay. um, there's no OPEX in previous years, and there's unlikely oh, to be okay. OPEX in 18, yep, yep. Uh, But it's wrapped up in the future years. So because clearly we won't um, have the station up and running uh, in the 2018-19 year. Yeah, okay. But we do have OPEX um, associated with the, the with full facility for the future years. Okay, okay, that's fine. Do you envisage that you'll get parking revenue from the park and ride? Look, they're, they're uh, decisions that um, uh, council is still yet to make. Uh, we have had a, 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 an initial discussion on that, and uh, we, 
we don't think in the short term it would be the right thing to do to charge genuine users of the service a parking fee. Uh, but one of the things we've got to work out uh, as we move forward is control of the parking site and how do we differentiate users of the uh, service to maybe other people that might come into the car park. Yep. So maybe one of those options that there is a charge for non-users of the service but no charge for users of the service. So we've recognised the issue and that'll be something we work through something over the next few months. Something that you'll have to work through. So, yeah. so the, the OPEX costs on um, at the bottom of paragraph 51 on page 55, that's the cost rather than any offsetting, yeah, yeah. That's any offsetting zero, revenue. Zero revenue, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, please. Um, no, I think it might be alluded to in the report, but just I know there was some confusion with the Regional Council on that TIFR rate of that 75.5 per cent that the funding was so dependent on. Has that been locked in or is that still a bit? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, yep, no, that's, that's um, all resolved. So there are about three issues that we needed more clarity on and they're all resolved now, and including that one. That was a big one for Regional Council. Resolved as per the business uh, plan. That resolved as per the business plan. The answer is 75.5%. Thank you. Yep. yep. Thanks. If there are no other questions, um, and look, Chris and I talked about this. If people want clarification on the designs or other aspects to do with this, we're always happy to bring that up, either offline or at briefings and things like that, because it will be quite a few things, including the name of the train and things like that going forward as well. Um, so we're, we're keen for councillors to try and get involved in that, basically. Um, so I'll move, have I already moved? Can't remember. Oh, yeah, and seconded by Martin. Thank you, Martin. OK, I'll, I'll put that to the show of hands. Those in favour, it's the hands. Against. And that's uh, Councillor Casson against. One against, thanks. Um, OK, councillors, we're on to... I'm wondering... The, I'm just looking at the time. Are we, what are we in a position to do? Do you want to do yours now, Robin, the speed management one? Yep. Number 12, Speed Management Report, to page 232. We'll just, Robin's going to come up. Can I move that Sorry? Can I move that? You can move it and seconded by Paula. Thank you. And uh, councillors, we're going to go straight to questions and uh, you know, spend as much time as you need on the questions and that to make sure it's clarified for you. I've got Mark, did you want to? Oh, no. Sorry. Who else has got a question? God, oh, we're going too fast here. <laughs> it's such a good report, Robin. <laughs> OK, if there are no questions, I'm, I'll go with that. Um, it's been moved and second. Uh, was that a question, Mark? No, it's a debate. Oh, you debate, all right. I didn't think, yep, yep, Mark's speaking to it. Three thank minutes, remember? Yeah, no trouble at all. Hey, look, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, this one's very dear to me, which is why I, I do want to speak to this one. If you drive down Gordonton Road now, uh, towards the new intersection, you actually have to train yourselves to slow down. If you follow the speed limit in that new reduced stretch, um, it'll take you 90 seconds longer to arrive at your destination, but it feels like it's so much longer and the reason I'm banging on about this one is that this is what Vision Zero will feel like. After a few trips, you'll get used to it, and it feels different, calmer, more relaxed, and safer. That's what Vision Zero will feel like. And you'll notice things. You'll notice the houses, the cyclists, the weather, and other vehicles. That's what Vision Zero does. Since that speed limit's been dropped, and thank you, Robin, and your team for doing that, there have been no accidents. None, zero. That's what Vision Zero is. Safer journeys through better infrastructure and better speed management. Vision Zero feels different, and it will feel different. The speed management plan is a, a very wordy document. It's colourful, but it's also very practical. And make moment, no mistake, this will impact the city. And they will grumble to start with. They will grumble, but I'm confident they'll be alive to grumble for much, much longer. At the Traffins Conference, I got very tired of hearing one Māori phrase. Norm, you would have loved this. It was, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata. And everyone got up and boldly said, hey tangata, hey tangata, hey tangata, as if it was the only Māori phrase they knew. But once I got over that was. sort of... 
the, yeah, well, once I got over that, I actually realised the impact of it. It is about the people, it's about the people, it's about the people. I understand now that there are people driving cars, there are people on buses, on bikes, trikes and scooters, skateboards, mobility scooters, wheelchairs, and on foot, walking and running. People want to get places, and it's up to us as a council to provide safe spaces, safe choices, and safe infrastructure. Some key points for the speed management plan. Speed will go down to 30 by every school during school hours, or beginning in the end of the day. They will grumble. Get used to that, because it'll become the go-to speed around more and more city areas as they get congested. Drive from Bryce Street uh, Bridge to Knox Street down Victoria Street, and it's a slow cruise. Drive the same journey down Anglesey Street, it's a drag race. Now try and cross the road on Victoria Street. Then try and cross it on Anglesey Street. Even worse, watch a kid try to cross those roads unsupervised. Residential roads will be built in the future for a 40k safe speed. Make no mistake, that will look different. And they will grumble. It's the difference between Galloway Street and Commerce Street. Try watching an unsupervised kid cross a 50k road. Good luck. Safety will cost. We'll be building raised safety track uh, platforms, curving berms, traffic throats, pedestrian refuges, cycle lanes, ramps and tunnels, and they will grumble. But we've budgeted for it. We'll be running advertising, and I will point out that tut 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 advertising, like make him make him stop talking, make him slow down, doesn't work, but information does. Thanks, Mark. I'll That's stop it. there. Yeah, you are. Stop. Yeah. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Can I just? Oh, I've got a killer phrase to end with. All right. All right can one killer phrase. One coming killer up. phrase. Safer journeys through safe roads, safe vehicles, safe speeds, and safe driving. Vision Zero feels different, but so does living. Thank you, Siggy. Uh, Siggy. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, I won't say as much as Councillor Bunting, but I just want to uh, refer to a gentleman this morning that was here. And when I first came into council, I remember Peter Boss um, calling me, emailing me, and Vision Zero, Vision Zero, Vision Zero. And I just congratulate people like that because we need people out in the public that remind us of what we really actually need to do. And it and, and it's amazing how quickly we've actually. Probably he's been saying it for 20 years and we haven't listened, but we are listening here and that's exciting. So I'm really excited what is happening. And yes, they will grumble and we it's just normal, but we know what to do with that. And um, and because we, we grumbled as well, so, you know, um, everybody grumbles sometimes. But it's it's just exciting to have that vision, that vision zero, and uh, we, we're moving in the right direction. And I'm always excited when I get a piece of paper with my hometown on it in Germany. So that m really warms my heart. So, um, no, not really. But it's a similar size to Hamilton. And uh, look, the Germans have grumbled that there too when they changed speed limits. I remember that. Uh, my mother grumbled. Um, but, you know, today uh, it's a safe city and it's a beautiful city to, to live in. And, and people know that they are safe wherever they're going. So very excited where we're heading with the speed management plan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Martin, please. Uh, yes, and again, I'll just make a brief reference to how the really good work that's been done through the Access Hamilton Task Force led, of course, by Councillor Bunting. Robin Denton and her team and, and the whole team, and I, I want to stress, and this is where you get the marriage between uh, the elected members and the professionals in the field, who, of course, have national and Australasian reputations as well. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, Sweden, Norway, could they do it? Uh, people would have said no. Do they have zero road fatalities? No. Do they have a zero vision? Yes, they do. Has their road fatality and accident rate over 20, 30 years dramatically reduced? Yes, it has. Why on earth, if the state of Sweden and Norway, Norway a similar population, interesting topography as well, not necessarily dissimilar to New Zealand in a number of senses, why, if a country like that of a similar population to us can do it, why can't we? We say there's going to be a lot of angry people. We have to be very careful we don't just assume that the aggressive driver who's in a certain pattern of behaviour represents all of us. Often it's a he, and he does not represent the young mum who wants to keep her cherished, beautiful children alive and safe. He does not represent on his accelerator those of us who want to cycle or, or walk and want to be safe for our kids and all of us. We also need to recognise, if we're going from A to B, intercity, 
with the right design of expressways, the speed limit has actually gone up to 110. It's a matter of actually calibrating Leo Tooman's great work. It's a matter of calibrating speed limits to what is appropriate. And I just want to go back to Bunty's point. It seems to be a 90 second delay to get home is a very, very small price to pay if you increase the chances of you getting home and your loved ones getting home alive and without injury. Thank you. Thanks. James, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, fully supportive of this. Um, and uh, like Siggy, I have to really congratulate Peter Boss. He has been pretty passionate about this for a number of years. I know it was a platform he um, uh, tried to get into council with last time, and he has been consistent, and he's pushed and pushed and pushed. Now, at the beginning, um, uh, you know, the likes of uh, Leo Turner and myself weren't for Vision Zero because we think it's unattainable, which it, it probably is. There are always going to be fatals, unfortunately. But... Um, you know, with Peter's passion on that, it has turned me around. You have to have some sort of um, uh, vision to uh, have a look at, and uh, we're looking at that. But in New Zealand, we have very aggressive drivers, and I think only the, the only other person that could say they've seen more dead bodies through uh, car accidents that attend would be Leo Tooman and myself sitting around this table. Um, and uh, certainly not a nice thing to deal with and having to, uh, to advise loved ones that their family members have died. It's a, uh, it's a pretty terrible job to do, and I've had to do that many times. But um, our driving system here, you know, our drivers are aggressive um, compared to other parts of the world. You know, I think Norway, they're a little bit more um, progressive and um, take the, the road rules a little bit more seriously than we do in New Zealand. And um, the likes of Gordon Thomas, where we're going to force the drivers into a certain pattern of driving is good, and that's the way to go, I think. So... Um, uh, fully support of this and uh, goes through, let's get our speed down in the city. Um, at least, uh, you know, accidents, if they happen, and they will happen, will be uh, a little bit more survivable. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to speak briefly on this too. I take the points that everyone's made, including James's one, about the, uh, the terrible consequences of uh, speed. I think for far too long... We've had put cars first and all of our city tr and countryside tr um, transport planning, um, and it's actually quite hard work in some of the regional and national forums to uh, turn that around. There's a lot of lip service paid to safer roads, but not much uh, engineering or money paid to, paid to that at the moment. Um, it, just to note that the current government's emphasis on safety on roads hasn't yet been matched by NZTA being able to fund uh, that, so that's a problem. I, I was proud that this council was the first in the country to bring in 40k speed limit, but we all knew when we brought them in that uh, we were still weren't uh, as low a speed limit as in many European, North American and even Australian sort of jurisdictions. So I'm glad that this now signals we're going down to 30 and that we won't have to have a special consultation when a new school's built about whether we bring in 30 k's or not. It's going to happen because there's a school there and there are vulnerable road users. I might point out... Um, I'm not sure who was mentioning this, that uh, a number of the drivers outside schools are actually young mums who have just dropped off their kids at school and then forget about the need for safety, and that's, that, that's certainly evidence about that. I think there's some more work to do on some other roads in and around the city. State highways are not yet governed by this. We need to get them on board too. We need to have a one network approach. Um, 80 k's on Greenwood, parts of Greenwood Street is nuts, um, but that's not our road. So we need to work out how we're going to get NZTA to get into the 20th century there. Same with some of the district to council roads around the city. If you go down K Road, you'll see four different speed limits in less than a kilometre because the jurisdiction is changing and the construction is changing, and that's not the only one where there's that sort of problem. So I think that um, this signals our intentions, but it's not the end of the job. So that's me. That's, you don't want to write a reply, Matt? OK, so we'll go to the vote. Moved, it's been moved and seconded. The recommendation on page 232, number two. Um, those in favour raise their hands. Against? It's carried unanimously. Thanks very much. It's great. Um, now, 
We've got time to slip in Karen and the Peacock program update. Where's Karen gone? I saw, oh, there she is. We're going so fast, we should have rules of debate like this in the future. <laughs> it's clear to, clear to me that it's the staff presentations that take all the time. <laughs> Plus, there's one other person that's absent from the meeting at the moment. Um, we're just putting around the uh, capital report, and the sorry, we're on page two fifty six, two councillors. So if you get to that, and I'll move that to put on the table, seconded by Ryan. Um, Karen, you've given us a fair few updates. Is there anything that may be attached to this that you need to add, or, uh, or is that Chris? Yeah, so um, we did have a attachment with the Peacock Capital Report in, in the report, but just because of the timing between when the meeting agendas are due, this is the most current version, and this is what will be presented in the Finance Committee. Okay. So yep. this, we've had that discussion about should peacocks be coming to the Finance Committee or to here and the getting alignment between the two types of reports. So this here is aligning with next week, is it next week's finance, yeah, yes. finance yep. Committee? So yep. that's the one we should look at today. Yes. Right. Okay, so we've got questions. Rob's first. Yeah, I guess that's my question. I guess that's my question, Chair. I'm, I still think, having read this report, and having now received this, that I'm fearful that we're still operating in a silo between the work that's being done on one hand and and the funding of it on the other. And, and I did raise this at the last update, and I think staff are going to go away and come back with what might be a good solution. I think this is by far the biggest project that we've got on our books at the moment. It's one of our biggest risks. Uh, irrespective of what others around this table suggest, um, there's huge both um, um, both build and financial risk in this whole um, this whole project, and I'm just mindful of the fact that we might find two or three years down the track that the silos haven't spoken to each other, and um, and um, you know, and I'm almost when I was reading this thinking maybe we should have. A report on pe a full report on peacocks, whether it's here or at finance, rather than have it in two different places at two different times. Um, but that's that's my thought. It might not have the support of others. Yeah. Um, look, uh, Councillor, I'd, I'd like to uh, just give you assurance that everything is lined up. We've put a lot of work into it. So what we uh, we took that message loud and clear from the last time we came and did the report. Uh, the decision uh, we've taken is to. Uh, bring a fuller report to this committee um, because it is about developing a community um, and, and so what you're seeing here is the full report um, but, hope, but please be assured that the financial information that you're seeing here is replicated um, to the finance committee and all of the financial um, implications of this program will be reflected through the finance committee reports. Um, there is a timing issue uh, as Karen has said and uh, there, there was just a slight change, which is why we've tabled the, um, uh, the revised update. But I don't expect that to happen as we move forward. Um, we fully understand the timing issues, but this is the full report. Everything's here. All of the financial implications will be tabled and discussed at the Finance Committee. So would we... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just mindful of the fact that there, because of that timing difference, we're looking at it at two different, two different events and in two different, two different viewpoints. Are we better perhaps to have the whole report here, including the finance, or are we better to have the whole lot at the finance report? You know, uh, it, it really is, I, I suppose, just the assurance to me anyway that we've got the whole picture in one report rather than at two different. Uh, you know, there's two weeks difference, I think, between this report and the finance report? Um, yeah, my answer to that will be um, that it is a small difference. It's not that significant. Um, things uh, don't change a lot in the, the, the two weeks, generally. So, look, like I'm comfortable that we can align the two and that um, 
um, the, the right information is at the finance report, particularly as it affects our financial strategy um, in terms of the collective uh, council business. So, look, I'm very confident that we can align things. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm going to put the report, uh, the recommendation that I moved. Did I? Okay, I'll move. And Ryan not gave me the little nod there. <laughs> uh, he seconded it. Okay, show of hands. Those in favour? Against? That's carried. Thanks very much. Councillors, I'm just wondering, let's start some of the GM's report stuff now. Um, Chris, why don't you? Are you City Growth? I can't keep up with your names. Oh, oh that's that's right. It's Kelvin. Why don't we start with that? These titles. Yeah. That's how the the CEO confuses the hell out of us by changing the names of the jobs. Yeah, Jen. Yeah. So councillors, we'll do, go through the City Growth ones, which are the first four. And they start on page 353. So we'll just get, hang on a sec, I'll just try and get that page up. So, councillors, what I'm going to, oh, hang on, that's wrong. No, it's not 353. Three, there's no page number with it. Oh, sorry, there is 277. Paragraph 4. Yeah, my apologies. We'll just go to that. I was looking at the wrong place. So, councillors, we we're not going to um, go and discuss each one. I'm going to move through the titles, ask if you any, any questions on that. If not, we'll move immediately on to the next one. We're not sort of going to try and wait around for people to find it. So we're starting with the, the list is there. The drop-in sessions, we've, there's no discussion on that, questions on them. So we're going to the CBD activation plan. Are there any questions on that? There, stick your hand up, it might be easy, and I'll just scan and then move on. So I've got Angela on that. That's uh, page 278, item uh, paragraph 7. So yeah, th thanks, Mr Chair. Um, I raised something that was supposed to be on the, ac uh, the action list, which, wasn't, which isn't what's here. Because um, this says about the vacant activation space within the city, and oh yes, sorry, it was. It was that, but it was also that um, we work with uh, we work with the association to get a proper um, uh, strategic evaluation of what the KPIs that we put into that action, activation plan. Remember when they reported last time, it was just a list of events. That doesn't tell me strategically the outcomes that this council was trying to seek, which should include um, uh, you know, the pedestrian counts and all of actually a strategic look at, at a strategic measure of the purpose of the activation plan. So I'm assuming that staff are working with them on that as well. I'm found a little wanting on this one, Councillor yeah. Angela. Yeah. I wasn't at the previous report, so um, I will take it uh, and I will report back. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Thanks, Chief. Kelvin. Um, there's no other questions on that. We'll go on to the sale and disposal of council land policy. Next uh, couple of paragraphs later, 9 and 10. Are there any questions on that? If not... Let's go on to the city growth policy and bylaw reviews, which is um, they tabled on the bottom of that page and on to the next one. Oh, sorry, just the bottom of that page, yeah. Chair, there is one small amendment to that, just oh, okay. the, uh, in relation to the uh, business improvement, the bid policy, uh, it's, it's now likely to be reported back to the committee on the 18th of June with a proposal to go before council on 27 June. OK, 18 June and 27 June, June at council, Yep, full council. OK, so if we can amend that in the... Uh, yep. Any questions on that? If not, that's fine, and I think we're done with you, Kelvin. Thank you. <laughs> you got away lightly.
Peacock won, but uh, there's no questions on that because we've already done it. It's not actually, sorry, I was just following the list of headings down here. So there's no questions on that anymore. Okay. So, councillors, why don't we break for lunch now, come back in, we'll say 10 past, knowing that you'll probably be back at quarter past. Um, and we've got the rest of the GM's report, but we'll start with the Regional Council PT update because we're giving them a specific time, and then we'll move on to public exclude, and it'll be the quickest meeting in the history of this council. And you started late. Yep. You get the chocolate fish. <laughs> okay, lunch. Thank you.